the only way that I know of that you can keep contractors accountable is by creating a detailed scope of work, knowing exactly what it is that you're looking to accomplish in this project. And then you have a payment and progress schedule set. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Van Sturgeon. Van, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I've been looking forward to this uh, uh, this conversation, uh, this jibber jabbering back and forth. So uh, looking forward to, to launching into it. Absolutely. And we had a good conversation beforehand, so I'm excited. A little bit about Van. He's an experienced entrepreneur of over 30 years and has been successfully creating businesses in the real estate industry that cover areas of land acquisition, development, management, construction, and renovation. And Van personally owns over a thousand properties across the country um, and is uh, semi-retired from day-to-day -day operations in his business, which I'm sure that's uh, you're probably pretty active still in it, <laughs> having the conversations already. So, um, well, with that said, Van, why don't, why don't you just give our listeners a bit more about your background and then kind of what you're doing today. Sure. I, I'm a product, uh, I, have a, I have a number of years on you, uh, at Todd, and I was a product of the sixties, born and raised in Chicago on the North side and, um, to my grandparents, uh, we lived in a one bedroom apartment on the North side of Chicago. And my parents, like, you know, most folks, uh, wanted to save up their dollars to be able to go uh, buy their first, dream home. And in the midst of saving up all their money, uh, they discovered that the apartment building that we were renting from had gone up for sale. Hmm. And so instead of buying a dream home, they, they went in this, uh, they grabbed all their money and borrowed some from some from family and put a down payment and they purchased uh, this apartment building. So instead of buying a dream home, they became landlords. And it was uh, during that was happened in the late 70s. And during that period of time, it was it was a nice building, nice area, fully occupied. And then unfortunately, uh, things started to turn pretty dramatically in terms of there's uh, the Durant hostage situation. The economy was miserable. Interest rates skyrocketed. So inflation rate was out of control, similar to like what we're experiencing now. Mm -hmm. And you all of a sudden this beautiful little building of ours had uh, it was going through 50 40 50 60 percent uh vacancy uh there was just this mass migration of folks out of the city into the suburbs hmm. and the neighborhood started to deteriorate it started to get bad and uh you started to see prostitution and stuff like that coming in and 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 then it got to a point where it trained so quickly that landlords that uh, around us were uh, torturing their buildings or so literally were setting their buildings on fire to collect insurance money because they couldn't, they could just couldn't wow. survive. It was just got to the point where interest rates were so high and red state income wasn't coming in. And yeah, I, and I, to this day, there's neighborhoods that you can walk through. You can see the remnants of the fire that occurred at that building. Now they're already renovated, whatever, but you can see some of that remnant still to this day. So in the midst of this, as a family, we, we had to do everything that we could to survive, meaning we did all the work that was associated with the, with the management, the maintenance of that building from, you know, doing electrical work, the plumbing, uh, painting. I don't know how many toilets I've cleaned in my lifetime, thousands of toilets. Hmm. And uh, we did everything that we could survive and we were able to uh, just get by and it turned out being the great, the best investment uh, that my parents could have made. Um, I went off to, uh, got through that period, went off to university, graduated. And like all parents, uh, my folks were have, hoping that I'd become a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. But uh, I broke the bad news to them and said I wasn't interested in any of that. And I wanted to get involved in renovations. I really enjoyed that. And so I uh, broke their hearts and <laughs> I opened up a little uh, little company and, and uh, as a general contractor and in Chicago. Uh, Got started in the late 80s, early 90s. So I worked my tail off, tried to, you know, on the hustle. And I kept running into these same folks, these same, these, these real estate investors who were buying uh, these houses and then I would renovate them and then they would turn on and flip them, sell them, or they would create a rental portfolio. And that's when I got, uh, 
I, I, I saw what was happening and realized, hey, maybe I should get into this as well. And so that my first uh, flip occurred in 1991. Uh, and at the time, when it's all said and done, I made something like around twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, which back then, Todd, that was, uh, yeah. that was like a salary, one year's worth of salary yeah. for many folks. And that really got bit my bit me uh, to the or showed me what real estate can do for you, the power of real estate. And uh, it's been a whirlwind ever since. Like I've uh, been very blessed in, in uh, open, being a general contractor. Then I created this portfolio of properties. Uh, and then from there, I got into property management. From there, I've also done land development, subdivisions, custom homes. So I've, I've been, I've done a lot of many different things and I've been, like I said, very blessed. And so I've gotten to the point where I'm semi-retired. I, I spend the beginning of my day looking after a couple of, uh, couple of interests that I have in business. Uh, I've got some great people, whether they're employees or partners in it. And, and then that's it. And then I, uh, I spend the rest of my time actually helping new real estate investors, which I really, I really do enjoy, uh, whether it's single family home and investors just walking in and trying to buy their first investment property all the way up to multifamily investors, typically syndicators who, uh, acquired their first investment property, um, and are struggling through that value add component associated with that. You know, we all, you know, we all have a plan. There's that famous Mike Tyson uh, line that we all have a plan walking in until we get punched in the face. So that's where I love that line. So uh, yeah, if that's you're going to do I value add, you're going to get punched in the face. Right. And so that's where uh, I'll step in and help folks out and making sure that, uh, that, you know, the right systems or processes are in place to be able to deliver on the uh, KPIs that have established for that particular investment. Love it. Love it. Did, did you ever, you went through this experience with your parents, like did, did that ever play into your mind as you're like, Hey, I'm going to start buying some properties <laughs> or how did, you know, how did that take me through that? Like that, that's a, it sounds like a, almost a traumatic experience, or maybe it was a great experience. I don't know. But as a kid going through that, it, it just doesn't sound pleasant. No, it wasn't pleasant. I can tell you instances where like money was tight and yeah. uh, to the point where we're waiting in line to get blocks of cheese from the federal government. Wow. And uh, I remember. Uh, and so you're like, hey, I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> well, not really. Well, I like uh, the, uh, the, the whole staff side of the business freaked me out. But uh, I really enjoyed problem solving. I, even to this day, I enjoy being able to walk into uh, a property, a house, uh, an apartment building that's struggling with some structural issues or something like that and trying to figure out the problems and how to, you know, the most cost-effective approach in resolving them and getting to that particular goal. So I've always enjoyed that problem solving aspect at an early age, moving forward, I look at buildings, I'm really intrigued by them, whether single family to multifamily, how they're constructed, how mm. windows are supported and all that kind of stuff. So I have always enjoyed that side, but I was traumatized by because uh, coming from that mindset or from that experience, it was difficult for me to let go of certain things in growing your business. Like there's only so much that you accomplish with two hands. And yeah. so being a micromanager uh, and that's some of the things that we talked about uh, before we got on this uh, before recording was how do you delegate? Like you, you want to do lots of different things, but you got to get be able to delegate to certain things to folks to be able to help you or, or you won't be able to get very far with, with just your two hands. So that's one of the things that I needed to overcome in, in my, uh, in my, because of those experiences I had early on in my life. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk value add. And that's that's your specialty, obviously. So you know, with the with the value add, it's easy to it's easy to make mistakes. Uh, you've got a lot more moving parts. You got just you just got a lot more challenges in front of you. So what what are some of your like key important you know tactics or strategies with the, with the value add? Sure. Like what I what I've always started with is. Uh, goal setting associated with that particular project, uh, with that asset. Uh, when we are looking at whether it's single family or a multifamily, we really need to make sure that we've identified and even actually go to the extent of writing down what our goal is associated with this, with this value add. 
and then uh, go out in the marketplace and validate it. Oftentimes, when we're in the process of acquiring a deal, we do some peripheral kind of uh, examinations of the marketplace, get some dollars, go get some numbers associated with that market, and then and then we acquire the asset, which is wonderful. But then, do you really know what it is that you need to do on a granular level? to the actual property that you've acquired to get you to that goal. So that really requires not only establishing a goal, but going out in the marketplace and validating it, going to neighboring properties, going into the marketplace. Do you really need to go to the extent of you know, placing the countertops to go into granite? Can you get by with a laminate countertop? Maybe you can get by with uh, you know just a $500 backsplash. Do you need to buy a stainless steel appliances? Can you just go into black appliances? laminate floor like lots of uh, there's lots of things that you need to figure out uh, at the end of that process to be able to uh, make sure that one that the goals are achievable and then what are the things that you need to do to your asset to be able to get to those to those goals and it's really a it's a it's a wrenching process because sometimes because i've encountered this there's sometimes where you um, Folks will acquire an asset and all of a sudden through really uh, do some valid, you know, going out in the marketplace and validating that they discover that it's not, it's not conceivable. We can't take a C asset and turn it into an A. Yeah. No matter what you do, uh, you can't throw in shoehorn a swimming pool in a fitness room to create that asset to turn it into an A. So those are the types of things that uh, folks need to, that's be the first step that uh, I would encourage people to do. And then once you've got that, and then the next thing is really is the budget associated with that. It's nice to know that uh, we got to do something and uh, to raise the value of this particular asset, but there's we need to identify what are those dollars that we're going to contribute to it. And it can't be an, a blank checkbook. It has to be a dollar figure. And, and once we have that number, once we have a goal and when we have a budget, then the next series of steps follows you know follow through that in that process to make sure that we don't have a situation where uh, we can want the moon and the stars and the sky associated with the, this particular renovation but the numbers are you know the dollars aren't there so we have to be diligent in what we can do with the property um, so once we have that budget then we move on to what I call like a, a, a needs and wants list and it's uh, you no know, keeping in mind the dollars that we have in the kitty Keeping in mind also the what what we need to do to the property to be able to reach our goals, the market research that we've done, and how we need to go on and do an assessment of the property. And needs are things that we have to do. So if we've got a pothole in the parking lot where it's a trip hazard, that's something that needs to be addressed. If there's a hole in the roof, that's something that needs to be addressed. And that's put under a need. Wants are things like... Um, you know, the wallpaper in a hallway corridor. It might be hideous and not, might not look all that great, but if there's money is in a budget, then we're going to use them to address that issue. If not, then we're going to have to live with that particular wallpaper that's in that hallway. So we create leads, uh, a list and a wants list. And, uh, and that should give you good inventory of what are the, 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 the issues associated with your particular asset. And, and then um, and then, the, 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 then we want you to do something that's, I find often that whether it's on the single family side or even multifamily is that you need to create a detailed scope of work. Uh, without one, it is, uh, it's like walking into a situation where you wanna bake chocolate chip cookies and you don't have a recipe, you don't have anything guiding you. You wanna build, you wanna make chocolate chip cookies. If you don't have a recipe, it's awfully hard for you to be able to follow through on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The detailed scope. I mean, these contractors. You're, you're, you've got this vision in your brain, right? And these contractors that are going to be doing the work, they don't, they can't see inside of your brain. They can't see what your vision. So you have to get that down on paper, and you have to really have a scope of what, what are we actually doing? Everything that we're doing, because otherwise things get missed, and, th and it's, it's no fault other than your own. Every, every single time, you got to look at yourself. And I've done a lot of value adds, and every single time, it's my fault. Right. Things got messed or it wasn't done the way I, my standards, it's my fault because I was too focused on my budget number or I or under budgeted. Right. And so, you know, well, they're going to get it done cheap because I under budgeted. I don't want it cheap. You know, I want this done right. Well, then 
pay for it, right? So there's so many different um, things that go into it. You talked about setting the goals with with the asset, what you're going to do, and then you you mentioned validating that. How do you validate? How do you how do you know if I should put in granite versus laminate? If I should do tile backsplash versus nothing? If I should go stainless steel versus black appliances? How do I, how do I validate that? I really, I, I, there's not, I always encourage folks to actually uh, go in the marketplace and visit those comparable proper, properties that are, that are near by your particular asset, do some secret shopping. Uh, also, mm -hmm. you should heavily rely on your property manager to be able to help you out as well. If they are uh, as part of your power team, the individuals that are helping you not only with this asset, but future asset acquisitions, it should be in their best interest to make sure that you're successful in this particular uh, endeavor. So they should be, they should have enough information and you need to go on the marketplace yourself to validate what exactly it is that you need to do. And that the market will tell you that's a beautiful part about this whole process is that there shouldn't be any unknowns. You should, the market will tell you based on what's out there, whether you need to go with black appliances or stainless steel, which saves you money. Uh, do you need to go with natural hardwood floor or can you get by with LVP? Like these are something, these are the, these are all the things that you need to figure out in the marketplace because you can go buy a hundred dollar toilet and there's thousand dollar toilets. There are brush nickel faucets and then there's just good old stainless steel faucets, the like chrome faucets. I'm sorry. So those are the types of things you got to go through in that process to be able to figure out. And so you don't give too much. Because everything that you give in terms of a renovation costs money. Yep. So uh, you got to, like, sometimes you can get by with a nice good old paint job, replacing the light fixtures and installing some blinds. And maybe that's all you need to do to raise. And sometimes often I find, you know, especially new multifamily, uh, uh, new ones, you know, syndicators, they, they, they want to push these rents up to, you know, $200, $300 on a value add. But you really are, you know, sometimes you can get by with you know, doing some light cosmetic stuff and just get a bump of $150, $200. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Well, so you're you always trying to push to get to the maximum. And I found that when you're up at the top of the maximum push, that it's pretty lofty. There's not a lot of oxygen up in that, uh, at, the, at that 30,000 foot level. And sometimes uh, you're going through periods of vacancy that uh, that. I love getting into situations where I've got a waiting list of, of people wanting to move in versus yeah. me going to top of the market. Sure. And, and I've gone through that process, learning process myself. I remember, uh, you know, 20 some odd years ago, acquiring this great, beautiful asset uh, in, in the middle of the city, renovated the heck out of it and went out there to market. And I was at top, top dollar. I wanted to get the top dollar. I wanted to squeeze out every single morsel I could. And guess what? I was able to, but... I went through periods of vacancy trying to find that person who's willing to pay top dollar. And once you look, do the arithmetic, because numbers don't lie, you start to figure out, you know what, this is like, maybe I should just I'm better off like knocking the rent down by 50 bucks, 75 bucks, and having a list of people, you know, rush you want to rush in and, uh, you know, without having to go through a month or two or three of vacancy. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense, but uh, yeah, it ma makes a learn. lot of sense. Well, and you got to look at your ROI too, right? But you know, you made a great point. Yeah. You, we can put, we can put a lot more dollars into it maybe get that $300 rent bump and potentially struggle, as you mentioned with some occupancy. But even if we, before we can get full occupancy, even if everything looks good and we get a $300 rent bump, could, could you have spent a lot less and got a 200 or $250 rent pump. And now your ROI is way better. The headache of actually doing that, the more money you put into a renovation, not always, but the more money you put in, typically means it takes more time to get done. And, uh, you know, it just, there's just more potential things to go wrong, especially as you're doing more items, right? So, yeah, you've really got to look at, how much are we making on this thing? Does it make sense? We will underwrite deals a lot of different ways. And that's what we do when we do our renovations uh, or decide is we're going to go, okay, what if we only put, you know, 3000 a unit into this thing? What's our rent pump at that? And what if we put 5,000? What's our rent pump at that? And what if we put 10,000? What's our rent pump at that? And we go, okay, well, this one makes the most sense. And sometimes it is the 10,000. 
but other times it's the five or maybe even less. Yep. I totally agree with you. And you have to, you have to play that out. Numbers don't lie. And real estate is a numbers game. I totally agree with you. And that's the same thing that we do as well is that you, you uh, identify certain things uh, again from the market, the market will tell you and you test it out and you, and you do the number crunching ultimately to figure out what the sweet spot is. And oftentimes that I've discovered is at least for our, from our, and our experiences uh, it's not going to the top, top of the mountain yep. is somewhere down below somewhere, somewhere there, the three to five K kind of range where you get the best bang for your buck. Um, because when you get up at that 10 to $15,000 per door, it's, uh, it's pretty lofty. It's yep. pretty. Yep. I, I def definitely agree. Um, uh, before we started recording, you're just talking about, we were talking about syndication we were talking about joint venture. Um, and, and you don't, do syndication, you're doing some joint venture, you're buying properties on your own. Take me through uh, kind of your process, what you like to do. And I, I know you mentioned some of the students too. So, so let's, let's just kind of dive in there and have a conversation about that. Sure. Uh, I, I know it's pretty fashionable now. We talked this about this off here about uh, the whole, you know, the syndication aspect of yep. growing a portfolio and, and there's definitely merit to that. Um, just unfortunately, now the, it seems as though there's a lot of skinny deals that are floating around that syndicators are trying to underwrite and mm. make happen. Yes. And as you know, and I know, it's not uh, difficult to make the numbers look great and phenomenal with a twist, a little mm -hmm. a bump here and a subtraction there. And I, for folks who are moving into this, uh, into this space, uh, one of the things that I would encourage folks is to look at that whole joint venture aspect, because that's how I built my business. Um, I had, I was fortunate enough to have a business that was cash flowing. It was doing really well as a general contractor. And I had a steady flow of income coming in from that to be able to divert into real estate investments, whether there was flips or creating a portfolio. But eventually you get to a point where you start kind of running out of money. And how I built my business was back then, you know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have this kind of stuff, uh, you know, in the nineties, you started. Uh, and, and so it was just being, you know, going to these local real estate investment associations, networking, and then all of a sudden you get to know people and then people will come to you and people will say, you know what, I don't know much about real estate investing, but since you are doing this, I like to get in on this action. So I was able to structure relationships where, Folks would put up all the money associated with not only the acquisition, but also whatever value add renovation we're going to do with the property. And uh, we would split the difference 50 50. And it worked out wonderfully for me, as well as for all the investors that I work with. And I was able to grow my portfolio in that fashion. Right now, we have a. Uh, for you to justify the whole apparatus and, and infrastructure that was necessary associated with uh, a syndication, you need to be up at a 35, 40 unit kind of and plus up in order to justify yeah. all the expenses associated with it. Anything that's less than that kind of, you know, doing the arithmetic, it doesn't make any sense. Nope. And so there's a sweet spot that I have found that there is at that four to six unit up to about that 20 ish kind of, range where a lot of mom, pa, mom and pa operators own these types of assets. They're getting old, they're getting tired. They mm -hmm. see the a jump up in the real estate market and syndicators look at them and you know it's too small for them. And then you got the single family home guys who or gals who just you know just don't have the wherewithal or finances to be able to launch into them. So those are really where I find and I recommend and and I've seen uh, folks uh, go into that particular segment. And they're doing pretty well. And I just we we're off there uh, again. We were talking. We talked a lot, but off air. One of that's one of the you know, recently one of my clients uh, transitioned from going out there trying to find syndication deals and went into the JV side and were, you know, had experienced success with that and uh, are seeing more more opportunities in that regard versus going uh, battling it out with uh, other syndicators who are looking chasing after similar deals. So. I would encourage folks to, whether that's even on a single family, duplex, triplex, all the way up. If you have, you know, there's a series of steps and uh, systems and process you got to implement if you want to go through that to take that approach. But uh, it is definitely something that can be done successfully. And I think there's tremendous opportunity in, in doing that. 
Yeah. That's one of the things I love about this business is there's so many different ways you can, you can structure your business. You can make money and buying those, you know, four to 20, 25, even, even some depending on the market, 30, 40 unit buildings, it can be a really good niche to get into because as you said, it's, it's too small for the syndicators, too small for no institutional firm's going to get, get into that. And, but it's too big or too daunting for most people off the street. You know, most, most people, even if they own some duplexes or single families, they're not, they don't know how to take down a 20 unit. They, that, that intimidates them. And so there's this kind of this, like it's no man's land, right? And it's a great opportunity for a lot of people to get into that. Take it from a mom and pop, like you mentioned. A lot of these mom and pops aren't running very efficiently. So that's where you can add a lot of value is just creating some systems and processes, being a lot more efficient in running those buildings. So I, I agree. I think it's a great niche for people to get into. And everybody wants to become a syndicator for some reason right now. And again, I, that's what I do. I like it, but it's certainly not for everybody. And it's not the only way to make really good profit in this business. Listen, I will go to the extent that I'm pretty sure you'll agree. Like, and you, if you already said, like there's thousands of different ways to be able to be profitable. That's the great thing about real estate. I think there's opportunities to even put string together a portfolio of single family homes. Here, there, there, there's institutions that are out there doing it as we speak right now. Yep. So it's just let the numbers dictate to you dictate to you in that chosen market of yours and hopefully you've done extensive market research yes. uh you let that mar- let, let it tell you where the opportunities are and and don't be uh don't have blinders on that you have to be a certain way there's opportunities mm-hmm. all around us uh a mindset of abundance there's opportunities everywhere uh you know for the person across the street down the block who's going through a mortgage payment uh, the mortgage issues or divorce or you know, there's an illness in the family or there's some type somebody died or inherited. There's lots of opportunities out there uh, in different asset classes. You just, you've got to get out there and, and network. And, and again, systems and processes you got to implement in your life to be able to bring those deals to the forefront. But one of the things that I wanted to, to bring, like one of the, to- I just mentioned to folks is that I often hear is that there's, uh, uh, you know, because we're in an overheated real estate market right now, finding contractors, folks that will, will, will look at your particular uh, project that yeah. folks struggle with. Um, and, and one of the things that I can speak as a, as a successful general contractor is that one of the things that I, as a successful general contractor, uh, if I'm busy, I, I want to make sure that my time is invested in opportunities that I have. There's a strong likelihood of me being able to uh, work on and be able to profit from. Yeah. And so it starts from that, uh, having a detailed scope of work. If you want to become yeah. a magnet to actual having contractors return your phone call, that is the document that's going to allow you to do that. If you have something that's structured that has, you know, all your specifications, what you want to accomplish within that, you, within that, and you have it in document form. And I'm, and I reach out to uh, a, a contractor to say, Hey, this is what I have, and I like you to price it out, price my project out. They're much more inclined to do so, and will look at you uh, in a different, uh, differently than the individual that you know randomly calls you, uh, calls you up out of the blue and says, "Hey, I'm looking to do a renovation. Come over here and, and create the scope of work for me and price it out." It, it, it doesn't work. It, 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 successful people that are in their, in this business will not just don't have the time for that. And so you elevate your game by your virtue of creating a detailed scope of work and going out there in the marketplace and you'll find good quality contractors that'll quite price on it. I, I work with clients all the time. And once they're able to accomplish that, all of a sudden it's a game changer in their lives. And also adds discipline. It disciplines you to not get into, well, I was going to buy the hundred dollar toilet, but this one with the fancy doodad costs 150. I'm going to buy that one now, or I'm going to go into a certain type of whatever finishes that, you know, if you got a scope of work, it, it kind of forces you to keep to that budget and yeah. being able to make sure that you complete the project on time. And it's one of the biggest struggles that folks have. 
So just wanted to mention that because uh, it's one of those things that uh, is, is not used often, especially definitely for on the single family home side, uh, 90 some odd percent probably don't have anything like that. Even on the multifamily side, I find that there is a something that you need to have like a boilerplate scope of work that you are, if you are active in a particular marketplace that you're producing the same kind of, you know, it's a, it's the same process over and over again. That's how you scale. I I love that advice because yeah, you're right. It's so easy just to it's that's easy for you. It's easy on you to just call a general contractor up or call, you know, whoever up and just go, hey, you know, this is what I want you to do. Come come over to this property. I'll walk you through it. And you walk them through it. You tell them everything, and you expect that they're going to provide you a quote and a detailed quote. But how do you do that if you haven't written it down. Again, they can't see the vision inside your head. So your vision is getting translated somehow to their head and how they see it, which might be totally different from what you're expecting. Now their quote, they they might come back to you with a $105,000 quote and you're like, what the heck? You know, I can't, I can't pay that. It was supposed to be $80,000. Well, it's because their idea of your scope was different from your idea of your scope. Have it written down, have a plan, then they can actually bid on it. Listen, I, and lots of folks, when I engage in uh, with them uh, uh, initially and they, they explain to me or show me or the pro, the, what they've gone through up to engaging with me, and I talk to them and, and it's the same scenario. I called four or five contractors up and one guy gave me a price of 60,000. Another one gave me a price of 100,000. Another one 150,000. Now, which one do I choose? Well, I don't know. How can you, how can you compare no. apples to yeah. apples? We don't have some sort of a document that's going to be able to show you that this is what you're getting. And these quotes typically from contractors when you don't have a detailed scope of work are vague and generic. And so when you get to the point where you actually uh, engage in the services of what particular contractor and, and all of a sudden uh, there's so much, you know, there's a problem right from the get go, because I thought you gave me this. No, no, no. I didn't give you that. I didn't include this. I didn't include that. There's so much, there's so much, just a, a lot of issues are created and it starts with you, the client, you are yeah. the one that's creating this. So that's why you should have, you shouldn't rely on your, the, the contractor to create the scope of works like inviting uh, the, the wolf into the hen house. No, no, no. You got to on your own. And if you can't do it, there are professionals out there who will do that for you. Mm -hmm. There's interior designers or structural engineers. There are architects who will create that detailed scope of work. And then you go out to tender and then guess what? By having that document, you're able to eliminate the riffraff because the riffraff the contractor who, you know, just got started in the business when he sees a scope of work like that, that's no detailed, their head will explode. They won't know how to price it out. And how often have we engaged in contractors? Because, you know, we're in the business of saving money and especially in the beginning, you go out and you find the cheapest contractor and you're hoping that they'll, you'll be able to get the, you'll get the, you know, you're going to get save some money. And then does it ever really work out that way? No. Yeah, actually, in fact, sometimes, most of the time, most end the up time. <laughs> losing money. Yeah. You're paying yeah. more money than you're supposed to because how much does it cost for uh, tile work that was installed all up and down all over the place to rip out, throw in the garbage, and then buy new tile to put down? How much time? How much money does that cost? And your that's contractor that you kicked off the job site ain't going to pay for that. That's a perfect example. It actually takes me back to my early days. I hired a contractor to install floor tile, and we didn't have a detailed scope. We didn't have the detailed requirements. And they installed the tile right on top of plywood. And, of course, that tile popped. Um, and and But... There was no, there was nothing I could really do because we didn't specify really much. We didn't have good contracts. And so I kicked them off the job, but we had to actually pop the tiles and reset them the right way because they didn't install them properly. But again, my fault, because we didn't spell it out properly. We didn't explain to them exactly what we needed and we didn't have good contracts set up. Mm -hmm. Look, it, it, we could talk we about We saved money in, at the start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you save money, but then uh, you didn't save money and they're losing money because you, you, <laughs> you figure out the amount of time and effort, aggravation, all that kind of stuff. You didn't yeah. listen. It, it's uh, 
it's just uh, you need to be as detailed as possible so that everybody knows what what you want. Because uh, mm-hmm. if I give you generic, I'm going to paint the walls and I'm going to charge you a thousand dollars to paint the wall. What does that mean? Do you clean? Are you going to clean the wall? Make sure that whatever paint you put on there adheres properly. Uh, how many coats of paint? Are you going to put a primer? Are you going to sand the walls? Are you going to what kind of quality of paint? How many varieties of paint are out there? Different mm-hmm. shades, sheens, yep. quality. Yep. So you need to do your, you need to spend time putting this together. And then once you create, it's very difficult in the beginning, but once you created it, then you can use that. Again, as I mentioned before, if you're a professional real estate investor, you can use the same body for the most part to your next project. In your next project, you've got a boilerplate. Yep. that you just keep stamping out the same gizmo every time and time again. Another problem, Todd, another problem, I'm speaking as a general contractor again, is that you know, these, there's these silly folks out there that are willing to give 30, 50, sometimes I even heard 70% upfront to these contractors mm. before they do any work. Now, what kind of negotiating stance positions that put you in when you've given up 30 50 70 percent up front before a contractor does any work do you do yeah. you think that contractor if he's got somewhere to work and it wants to jerk you around is he going to do that to you oh yeah versus yeah, if you, versus if you put 70 percent up absolutely absolutely and but i see it all all the time i see these message boards on facebook and places like that oh you know the contractor disappeared on me oh the guy did well how, how, did you pay him if you pay them, he's going to disappear. Trust me, don't pay them. Once he finishes work and you pay them, they're going to they're going to show up because if they if because uh, you owe them money, and that's how you should be structuring your relationships with contractors. You should have a payment schedule and a progress schedule, so mm-hmm. that every step of the way there are certain milestones that the contractor reaches, and that has to do specifically with an electrician or a general contractor, or a plumber, or whatever. Every single person has to have certain milestones, and that's when they get paid. Why, why are God, contractors getting 30, 50, 80% up front is boggles me. And I'm speaking as a general contractor with my clients that I do business on an ongoing basis. I can't go to them and say, give me 30% up front, unless it's like special order material, mobilization costs. Yeah. But other than that, the demand 30, 50%, that's just ridiculous. But I see it time and time again. Yeah, it, it and I think a lot of people just assume the contractor said it, so it has to be so. Versus, look, it, it's all negotiate negotiable. Of course, a contractor wants money up front. Why wouldn't you? But it doesn't mean that's the only requirement for them. And and quite frankly, if it is, probably find a different contractor. Right. Unless, Absolutely. like you said, there's certain circumstances, right? There's there's special order materials or, or things like that. But you, you certainly should not be paying for labor up front. No, you shouldn't be. But in that 30, 40, 50 percent up front, it's, it's commonplace for this kind of money that folks are uh, the contractor uh, are requesting and real estate investors are putting up that money. And it's right across the board, Todd. Yep. Whether a single family or multifamily, they're putting yep. up this kind of money. I'm scratching my head for what? You go try to do that with your employer. Go to your employer and say, if you've got a W-2 job, go up to your employer and say, I want to get paid a month ahead of time. Guess what? What is that employer going to say to you? The only place that people get paid up front money, like an entity is like McDonald's. You go to McDonald's, you, you pay up front to get your hamburger, and you sit off the side, wait for McDonald's to make it free and give it to you. None of these contractors are McDonald's. So stop treating them that way. You lose control. Money is the only thing that can control your project. Yep. If you, and you lose control over that. Uh, and, and then, so that's why budgets will be blown. Time, they take a lot longer and quality won't be there because you got no negotiating. You know, if, it, if I already paid up front for, for lots of the stuff that's being done, uh, the guys will just skip out. They'll walk away from the 10% that, they, that, that you owe. That they that you owe them because hey, there's so much work that's outstanding. What you know? Okay, fun. they just disappear and go on and work uh, at another project. So you got to keep that. You got to make you got to again. You got to put this up front. You got to figure this out up front. Time is absolutely money in real estate investing. You know, it's, it's velocity of capital. It's it's so huge, and it's I think it's such. such misunderstood so misunderstood in this industry of how much you're losing if you're not renting your units 
uh, if you're not able to sell the asset, if you're doing a flip, how do you make sure your contractors are staying on time and hold them accountable for that? That's about only the only way that I know of that you can keep contractors accountable is by creating a detailed scope of work, knowing exactly what it is that you're looking to accomplish in this project. And then you have a payment and progress schedule set. And, and the, the, as of these milestones, the contractor is going to get paid. Now, as you go along, this particular contractor isn't able to hit that uh, the second milestone, third milestone, for whatever reason, then you need to be step in. You need to step in. You need to get rid of that person. You need to bring in someone else. Because uh, so I find new real estate investors sort of fall in love with their contractor. Mm. He's such a nice guy. He's struggling. He's having some problems. His uh, painter didn't show up and the electrician didn't show up and whatever, whatever. You know, there's, there's lots of stories that a contractor will tell you. And again, I'm speaking as a general contractor myself. If you want to hold, see, one of the, uh, the, I, I, the misconceptions out there is that as a general contractor, I somehow have an electrician, a plumber, a painter on staff that they're going to come at, at my beck and call. That's not, that's not, I, I have to, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an orchestra. Like I'm a, what do you call it? A conductor in an orchestra. Yeah. Yeah. I have electrician, a plumbers and planers that I have relationships with, but they're their own entities. Yeah. And I coordinate all of them to, to, uh, to your project. And so you've got a, a you as a general contractor uh, need to make sure that you have all your ducks in order to make sure that project co is comes in at time and then budget and all that good stuff. And so if, if you're not doing your job and you're certain, you're not hitting certain milestones, you got to, you as a client, you need to bounce that guy out and find somebody else. It's as simple as that. Not everybody's good at what they do. Unfortunately, what you'll find is that 80, 20 rule. 80% are not very good and 20% are good at what they do. You need to go through a process of finding those individuals that fall into that category of 20%. And if often you'll find those individuals are in hot demand. So how do you differentiate yourself from you uh, as a client looking for a contractor to be able to do business with on an ongoing basis? Well, you differentiate yourself by having all your ducks in order, by sh being professional, how do you become a professional? Create yourself a detailed scope of work, act the part, making sure all your I's are dotted, T's are crossed, know exactly what it is that you want. And you, you reach out to a guy like me who's, who's good at what they do. And I, when I see that, I know that I'm dealing with somebody who's a professional. I like dealing with professionals. Why? Because I make money by turnover a product. The more projects I can do within a span of a year, the more money I make. I don't like projects where I sit there and milk it. There's no, no, I'm not into that. I want to do, if I can do 20, it's better than doing 10. Yep. Right. So yep. that's, that, that's the, so that's, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. That was great. Man, we, we've covered a lot uh, on the value add. Um, outside of value add or including value add, what's a mistake that you've made and, and how have you learned from it? We kind, of we kind of touched on this in the beginning in that I, when I got started uh, early on in my life, uh, and based on my experiences, I was a micromanager and I had to do everything myself. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where I was burning a candle at both ends. I was growing, I had a successful business. I was growing as a general contractor. Then I was doing the flipping thing on the other end. And I was, I, I you know, I came from a mindset of, having to do everything myself because one, I want to save money. And two, I could only, I was the only person that could do it well and nobody else yeah. could. And yeah. I still struggle to that with that to this day. And so I got to the point where uh, I, I almost had a nervous breakdown early on in, in this, you know, early on. And I realized that this is, there's something wrong here. This isn't, I was supposed to enjoy this, not, not, you know, not freaking out. And it was through, you know, mentorship through coaching that I was able to overcome that and learn that about systems or processes, incorporating them into my life. And I haven't looked back. Uh, I, I've been able to grow my business and be able to get to where I've been. I'm very, I've been very blessed in my life. And as it was from that experience. So uh, yeah, I, I strongly encourage folks uh, you know, to get in that. I think that's one of the entrepreneur's biggest downfalls is that we control everything. We try to do it all and don't delegate 
don't put the systems and processes into place. And we end up probably making a lot of money, growing the business, but we're so stressed out. We're And we're quite frankly, a lot less profitable and a lot less successful than if we just got out of our own way and push forward with other people in the, you know, in the right roles and, and systems and processes to do the work the right way. I, I, you, uh, you said a lot better than I did. I totally agree with you. And that was one of the things that I was able to, fortunately, I, I learned early on uh, that really was a game changer for me and my, and the success that I've been able to enjoy in my life. Love it. Love it. All right, Van, a couple last questions. What's a, what's a favorite book that you can recommend to our listeners? I really, uh, it's an oldie, but a goodie. I really strongly recommend folks uh, read uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I think it's yep. a fabulous book that talks about uh, you know, mindset, talks about goal setting. It's an extremely powerful book. And every once in a while, I'll reread it because there's so many great things in that book that folks should incorporate in their lives. And you will see tremendous benefits from it. It's just in the very, it's just at the end of the day, it just puts you in a, it puts you in that state of mind of, yep. of abundance and happiness. Yep. That's uh, that if you're in a, if you live in a realm of positivity, it's, it's remarkable what you can accomplish. We are very blessed. We truly are oh, very yeah. blessed to be living in a country that we live in, to be able to, uh, you know, the family, the friends, the whatever we have in our life. If you look at it, there's so many people out there that don't have what we have, yeah. whether it's health, whether it's our hair, whether it's our clothes, there's so many things that we should be thankful for. And I spent a good part, I, I spent, I allocate a portion of my life every day thinking about this. And it's from that, it's from reading that book that's being, that I've been able to draw those types of things in and incorporate in my life. I love it. Love it. All right. Last question before we wrap, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? I, I think that uh, this is kind of abstract stuff, but I'm a huge uh, proponent of goal setting. I think that uh, we, we need, our, we need uh, to set our targets on things in our lives and then reverse engineer from that. So goal setting is number one. I don't think a lot of people do enough of it in writing their goals down yeah. and actually having them in front of them is incredibly important. Yeah. Positive mindset is another one uh, that it's amazing what we can accomplish. There's folks out there who's listening to this podcast who are still struggling to figure out what they should be doing with, uh, you know, with, with certain dollars that they have. And, and I, I would encourage them to get out of their comfort zone. And getting the positive mindset and making taking that step forward, whether it's doing it on their own as you know, starting embarking on real estate investing, or whether finding good, great uh, partners like yourself, investing in future opportunities and deals, and you got a tremendous track record that people uh, you know could look at and should be able to have a part of. So getting out of that, you know, creating being in that positive mindset definitely is something. It's one of those things about learning how to drive a car. Like if you remember back when you uh, when you were 16 years old, the apprehension you had when you got behind the steering wheel for the first time, and then all of a sudden you're able to. Two years later, you're whipping around corners and you're you know doing you're driving more than you're supposed to in terms of speed. It's mindset and how we position ourselves. To, I want people to get out of their comfort zone and think things uh, think of things about things positively. Yeah. The last piece of business uh, pillar is. Like why, why do folks continuously reinvent the wheel? I'm a strong proponent of coaching mentorship. I, I loved, I've, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in my life, uh, throughout my life in reaching out to folks that have done it. And then I, and, and they helped me, I just copy from them. <laughs> Essentially, I just copy from yeah. them. They have yeah. systems and processes that developed in their lives that made them extremely successful and I'm able to learn from them and incorporate them in my life. I'm, it's, it's such, it's so easy. I, I, and, and I'm, and I'm a testament to it. And I'm sure you are as well that uh, go out there and get mentors and coaching to be able to get you to that goal setting that you know, whatever that goal is that you have in your life. Yep. Yep. It's been, it's been done before. You might have a little variation, a little twist, but it's been done before. So don't try to reinvent the wheel. 
Love it. Love it. Well, Van, look, really appreciate the time. Tons of great information. Really dove deep into value add and into, into the construction phase, which we don't often cover on this, but so super valuable and important topic. So really appreciate it. How can our listeners get in touch with you, learn more about what you got going on? Oh, I'm all over. Uh, I'm on social media. So if folks are more welcome to reach out to me uh, on Instagram and, and Facebook. Um, I also have uh, a website, vansturgeon.com. There's a bunch of information there and free tools that folks can uh, can download and and read more articles of things that I've been uh, that I've written and podcasts I've been on. So to get there's a lot of information out there. I'm really a strong proponent on this whole value add and doing it right. Um, it's just as important as it is to find a great deal. It's just as important to make sure that you know how to do that renovation value add, whatever you want to call it, because I've seen great deals get screwed up by. Uh, you know, identifying the wrong contractor and like some of the things that we talked about uh, earlier today. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If you find a great deal, it's not a great deal if you screw it up. Yep. Love it. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Van, again, really appreciate it. And uh, you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe, uh, give us a thumbs up, go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. But your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.